Four Avro Lancaster heavy bombers of 617 Squadron roar down the runway at RAF Scampton and leap into the air. Each aircraft carries seven young men and a new type of weapon, a weapon that only the most eccentric and brilliant mind could have conceived. The first aircraft to launch are that of Wave 2, who have a longer route to their target. Wave 1, led by the commanding officer Wing Commander Guy Gibson, begin taking off 8 minutes later. The events leading to this moment have been nothing short of miraculous. The Specialist Squadron has been formed with a single mission in mind, to attack and destroy the hydroelectric dams of the Ruhr Valley, Germany's industrial heartland. A successful breach of the Ruhr dams would not only cause major disruption to hydroelectric power generation in the region, but the resultant flood would wreck factories so crucial to the German war effort. Barnes Wallace, engineer at Vickers, had been working on a concept where a 22,000 pound earthquake bomb would shatter the dams if dropped from an altitude of 40,000 feet. However, not even the latest Lancaster bomber would be able to carry such a bomb and the accuracy required would have been impossible from that height anyway. After experimentation, he realised that a much smaller bomb could breach a dam, but only if detonated against the wall of the dam itself underwater. Some kind of airdrop torpedo would seem the obvious solution, but the German military had already protected against this by setting up multiple heavy steel nets from the waterline to the lake bed. This would stop any torpedo well short of the dam wall. Wallace's solution would become one of the greatest pieces of innovative thinking of the Second World War. He began to experiment, firing an object into the water and skipping it like a stone. If a mine could bounce over the torpedo nets, stop against the dam and sink to the bottom before exploding, the dams could breach. Just after Wave 2 crosses the Dutch coast, two of the aircraft are hit by flak. The Lancaster piloted by Pilot Officer Byers crashes and Flight Lieutenant Munro's aircraft sustains damage to its radio and aborts the mission. Shortly after, Rice flies too low and the mine mounted underneath his aircraft clips the sea, dismounting it. He also aborts. All aircraft are flying at extremely low levels to avoid detection. Also, because the bouncing mines must be released at exactly 60 feet altitude to achieve the skipping effect. The crews have been training hard over the previous weeks to sharpen up their low flying and to drop dummy mines at the exact correct speed, distance and height against dams across the UK. The Lancasters have been modified not only to carry the specialist weapon, but also to impart a backspin of 500 RPM on the mine itself before the release, to aid the skipping across the water. At 11.50pm, Barlow's aircraft clips some power lines and the aircraft crashes. Wave 1 is split into three groups. Group 1, led by Gibson himself, is to attack the Myrna Dam first. Groups 2 and 3 are to follow and move to the Ada Dam even when the Myrna is breached successfully. Wave 2 is to target the Zorpa Dam. A third reserve wave take off later and will reinforce the attacks where ordered. Gibson's Group 1 runs into some heavy flak and Hopgood is hit, but is able to carry on to arrive at the Myrna Dam just after midnight. Gibson orders his flight to orbit while he carries out a dummy run on the dam. Further behind, Astol from Group 3 of Wave 1 also crashes into power lines. McCarthy's is the only Lancaster from the five aircraft of Wave 2 to make it to the Zorpa, and at 12.15am begins dummy runs. Back at the Myrna, Gibson informs Hopgood that he's ready to make his attack, and that Hopgood is to take over command of the mission if anything happens. The Lancaster descends and screams over the water at 60 feet. A wall of anti-aircraft fire flashes up to meet them, while the nose gunner desperately tries to give some back. After what seems like a lifetime, the bomb aimer is satisfied and releases the mine. They roar over the dam and turn away. The mine bounces up to the wall of the dam, sinks, and explodes with a great plume of water. After momentary elation in the attacking Lancasters, they realise the dam has not breached. Hopgood is next. On his run-in, his aircraft is hit by flak, but he drops his mine. It bounces over the wall of the dam and explodes on the pump house below. The explosion peppers the overflying Lancaster and it crashes. As Martin makes his run, Gibson bravely flies slightly ahead to draw fire from the defenders, 
As the mine hits the water, it veers away and explodes away from the target. Gibson now calls his most senior crew, captained by squadron leader Young. Again, Gibson overflies the dam to draw fire, and Martin accompanies Young on the run-in. The mine is a perfect hit, but the dam still remains unbreached. Over at the Zorpa Dam, the terrain is making it very difficult for McCarthy. This dam requires that they drop the mine flying along the dam wall, as opposed to towards it. McCarthy has made nine attempts, and every minute over the target increases the risk of being found by German night fighters. Having lost the rest of Wave 2 on the way to the target, it's unlikely that one mine will breach the dam, but they are there to do a job and won't leave until it's done. On the tenth attempt, they finally find a perfect approach. The mine explodes on target, but the dam does not breach. They turn for home. Back at the Myrna, Maltby attacks. Gibson and Martin once again attempt to draw fire away. This time, as the mine explodes, large pieces of stone and mud fly skywards in the plume of water. As an enormous torrent of water bursts into the valley below, Gibson sees that the great Myrna Dam has been smashed. Gibson sends Martin and Maltby for home. He and Young lead the three remaining armed Lancasters, skippered by Knight, Morsley and Shannon, towards the Ada Dam. Away to the west, the reserve aircraft of Wave 3 are en route. They've taken off two and a half hours after everyone else, and will be dispatched to whichever dams are still standing when they arrive. Gibson arrives at the Ada at 1.30am to find the terrain very challenging. The run into the dam is very short, requiring a sharp and dangerous 90 degree turn and giving very little time to stabilise the Lancasters on target at 60 feet. Tall hills surround the dam, making the manoeuvre into and out of the bombing run extremely treacherous. Shannon tries first, but can't descend low enough in time after the steep turn into the bomb run. He makes three more attempts with no joy. Gibson orders Shannon to orbit, so Morsley can have a try. After two attempts, he also fails to drop his mine. The 90 degree left turn onto the dam is proving very difficult to judge. Shannon makes another dummy run, before finally completing the turn well enough to release the mine. It scores a direct hit, but the dam does not breach. Morsley tries again, and this time judges the turn, dropping his mine. Unfortunately, the mine detonates prematurely as it hits the dam wall. His aircraft is hit by debris, and he disappears into the darkness, likely with damage to his radio. He turns for home without communication with the others. Knight's Lancaster carries Wave 1's last mine. After a single dummy run, he manoeuvres his Lancaster and drops his mine. It skips over the water, hits the dam, sinks below the waterline, and explodes, breaching the Ada Dam. The survivors of Wave 1 and 2 turn for home. Wave 3 have crossed the Dutch coast. The first casualty is Pilot Officer Burpee's Lancaster, shot down by flak near Eindhoven. Not realising his aircraft has been lost, Bomber Command attempts to send a message ordering Burpee and Anderson to attack the Zorpa Dam. Townsend is sent to the Anepa Dam. Otsley is shot down by flak north of the city of Ham. Still without radio comms, Morsley is shot down by flak on the way home, north of Emmerich. Gibson's second in command, squadron leader Young, is shot down with his crew as they cross the Dutch coast westward, about 20 minutes from home. At just after 3am, the weather has deteriorated over the Ruhr. Heavy fog has made navigation by landmarks impossible. Anderson is forced to turn for home after being unable to locate the dams. Brown makes it to the Zorpa, but the fog is making an already difficult bombing run nearly impossible. He makes six attempts and eventually releases his mine with no breach of the dam. Soon after, Townsend locates and attacks the Anepa Dam. The attack results in another successful explosion of their mine, but no breach. With hindsight, it seems strange that he was sent to the Anepa instead of dropping a third mine on the Zorpa which might have been the one to breach it after the earlier weakening. All remaining aircraft would make it home safely. At 4.15am, Wing Commander Guy Gibson lands. The raid was a success in that it dealt major damage to the German industrial war production in the region, 
and forced a massive diversion of resources to repair the dams and industry that would have otherwise been used against the USSR on the Eastern Front. Gibson and others on the raid would receive the Victoria Cross for gallantry under fire. Eight of the 19 Lancasters were lost. Of the 133 young men sent to smash the dams of the Ruhr that night, 53 did not come home.